our tonight is our final event of the year, the academic year. We will start up again um, in September. Um, and our guest tonight is a longtime friend of the program, uh, Michael Moran, who uh, has a tremendous uh, resume. I'll put as the highlights. Perhaps the most important highlight is that he is a, a, a once and hopefully future faculty member in the program, um, having taught writing about international affairs here for 10 years. And we haven't had him um, give a public talk here because we don't actually, as a kind of policy, we don't have our faculty members give public talks here. Um, so we're able to, in this, what will hopefully be a fairly brief window between having left and coming back, um, actually have him give a talk, which is uh, a great for those of us like me who don't actually get to hear him speak on a regular basis in class or anything like that. Um, when Mike started uh, teaching at BGIA, he was a correspondent for MSNBC, and I remember students would, uh, 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 I've been doing this for 11 years, believe it or not, it's some time ago, and students would come into the office and say, Mike Moran just emailed me, he's going to be on TV in three minutes, can we put on the TV? Because um, we had one TV that got cable in like the central, um, of the student lounge area of our space at the time. And then, of course, that got us excited in the office, too, because we're like, oh, we're not on TV. So that was, <laughs> um, so we thought that was, that was always cool, and then we'd run down and see that. Um, he also was um, the editor of CFR.org, the Council of Foreign Relations uh, website, um, the vice president of uh, Rubini Global Economics, uh, Noriel Rubini's um, global risk firm our economic forecasting firm, an editor-in-chief at Renaissance Capital in London, um, and if currently is a vice president of Global Risk at Control Risks Group, um, which I definitely recommend that you look at the website for, because it's a very interesting firm. Um, I probably take all night talking about it, how cool it is, but I won't do that, because um, no one cares about that. But I will say that they are, uh, um, one quote I found online is, a world market leader in kidnap advisory. <laughs> um, and that's not advising on how to kidnap. <laughs> that, it's, the, it's the reverse of that. Um, he's also the author, most recently, of The Reckoning, Debt, Democracy, and the Future of American Power, which is fairly recently out in paperback here. Um, and also the winner of three Emmy Awards. Um, so probably the only Emmy winner um, teaching at Bard, I would assume, <laughs> if not if not anywhere um, uh, else in the in the Northeast. Um, I should also say, uh, just to make it even more about the program, um, as well, um, Mike has taken interns from us at all of these different places uh, and has hired a number of um, former students to work for him at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, at Control Risks right now, um, at Rubini, um, and, uh, and and as well the Overseas Press Club. Um, and it is a great to have him back in the United States after some time in the United Kingdom. Um, and here at BGIA, uh, which is uh, I think about 60 or 70 yards from his current office. Um, and his talk is a thin-skinned and short-sighted um, America's foreign policy drift, um, and he'll talk for 25 minutes or so, and I don't bang on time unless things have gone awry, and then we'll uh, turn over for a Q&A. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Johnny. This is so familiar. <laughs> the people in this room put up with me literally hours on a regular basis. So I see some familiar faces here. Uh, I'd like to thank Johnny, uh, and I'd like to thank Bard in particular for this program. Uh, I used to, when I was a kid, I lived in the Jer Jersey Burbs. My parents, uh, well, my, my dad's an Irish immigrant, but they grew up in New York City, basically, and we had a lot of the tribes still in New York, uh, some of them in the Bronx. and. I would go and spend two weeks every year with my cousin, Jackie Sullivan, in the Bronx. 
uh, at 205th Street, which is the best part of the Bronx. And my mom used to call it the Dirty Air Fund, which was kind of like, you know, instead of the Fresh Air Fund. Uh, and we, I'd go in there and I'd learn how to, you know, throw things off of the roof at the where we can get across the hall, and you know, they, there'd be all these little wars going on. It was very 70s. <laughs> um, and what I've always uh, admired about this program, I went to a city school, I went to GW. But to me, if I had gone, one of the reasons I went to GW is because I didn't want to miss the kind of, you know, ferment, you know, craziness of the city. Um, and I regretted it because I had no campus, I had nothing. But so many of my students, through the years at BGIA were, were kids who went to fantastic schools that were the kind of classic kind of um, Emersonian, you know, <laughs> places in the, in, the, in the woods or in some, some hill or in some lake. And this was their opportunity to come into New York City and club. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there, was a, there was a mixture of social and, and, and academic <laughs> counseling that went on here. Uh, but the wonderful thing was, it was a cream of the crop kind of a program, too. People got in here because they did well uh, in their first few years in the normally the liberal arts school that they were in in New England or the Midwest or wherever. Uh, and many people from overseas as well. Um, so I really loved teaching here. It was a really great thing. And I think Bart should do the opposite, too, and offer kids from NYU and Fordham the opportunity to spend a semester in Hammond. I think that would be really good. Um, so, I have this stump speech, and I'm not going to give it to you, uh, but it, it revolves around the idea that uh, the United States um, is widely misunderstood, which is easy to say, but mostly by itself. I think that panic is the great enemy of the United States. Uh, we run around like chicken little. We are a nation of people with very short attention spans. Um, and that's not a coincidence. We are the leaders in all sorts of technologies that develop short attention spans, that encourage and almost genetically predispose us to have no ability to appreciate history or context or the future. And then you see this not only in the average, average bear, but in our economists and in our politicians our corporate CEOs, and even in our sports, uh, you know, stars. They, there is just a kind of right now is, is the moment. They live in the moment. History doesn't matter. The future is, well, it's the future. We can't predict it. Um, I don't believe that. I think in, I hope, wider, more kind of sweeping terms. And when I look at the United States, I'm fairly, uh, I, I'm like everybody who's sentient, I'm a little concerned. Um, but I'm fairly bullish. I think the United States has a good story. I think the United States has a ability to correct its mistakes that is unrivaled anywhere in the world. And the president we have right now is an excellent example. On the other hand, the president we have right, right now is an excellent example of focusing too much on the day-to-day -day and not enough on the longer term. So I want to develop that theme a bit. I think um, many of you here, if Unless Bart has changed radically in the two years that I've been taught here, many of you here had an Obama sticker on something, <laughs> um, and um, I relished the Mitt Romney and before that McCain students that occasionally somehow slip through the, net, <laughs> the submarine net and get into the harbor of Bart, <laughs> and, and it was wonderful because you had a counterpoint. In the, in the room. And there needs to be a counterpoint. And if you don't believe that, go look at South Africa. Look at what's happened now that Nelson, Nelson Mandela is not there to provide the, the kind of paternal voice of reason. That's a disaster area. South Africa is a one party state. So is Russia. Those are supposedly uh, places that we're worried about in, in the context of the BRICS. I think that's silly. I think those are places that have deep problems, much deeper than the United States. Okay. Expand on that a little bit. So back to my dad for a second. My dad's an Irish immigrant. Came over here. Long story short, his parents were already here. He was brought, raised by his uh, his aunt and uncle in an awful mud hut, literally, with a thatch roof in Western Ireland. 
until he was about seven years old. And then suddenly, miraculously, money which appeared at, at my uncle's door to send the little Eddie around back on a Cunard steamer to America. And so they took him down, they gave him to a, a you know, Cunard stewardess and across he went. He had been raised till that moment to think his parents were his aunt and uncle because they never knew if the money would come. And so they told him, don't worry, Eddie. You're just going to America to get a bicycle, and you'll come right back. And so he went, and he bounded down the gangplank through immigration. And there was my grandmother, his mother, who said, Sonny boy, and hugged him. She, this is the family lawyer. Apparently, he pushed her away. She said, I don't know who you are. I want my bicycle, but I'm going back to Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> and imagine the trauma of learning that that wasn't true and into schools in Morningside Heights my dad went. Uh, he did very well for himself. He was the middleweight champion of the Marine Corps in uh, Korea. He was, then he went to night school. He, the, 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 the inability to top him never ends. Went to night school, became a corporate CEO. It, it's just crazy. <laughs> um, but through it all, he had this kind of America in his mind that I could never see because I was first generation, but uh, you know I had some privilege. My dad had made it, um, but I try to keep that in my mind too. It's very easy, particularly if you've you've been someone with some means, to forget that someone like my father could show up, dump on me, gang, off the gangplank of a Cunard steamer, and end up where he is, uh, where, where he was. He basically lost lost it. <laughs> but he did a great job in his life. He raised a family. He, he sees an America that I have to keep in my in my vision. Now, my book's called The Reckoning, right? <laughs> so clearly, I have another mirror that I look at. Uh, and I am concerned about the United States. And one of the reasons is because, as I said, we have this inability to appreciate the things that our very strangely unregulated and oddly incentivized society produce. It's not going to ever be utopia because it's not designed to be. The founding fathers talked about the pursuit of happiness, and that is a wild concept. Any, there is, that doesn't exist in any constitution on the planet, particularly the classic European constitutions, which were very, very legalistic very, very uh, constraining of what people do as opposed to what government do. So we always have to approach where we are and the plight, I think, of it, as of America, as something that grows out of this interesting group, which is that our government has the constraints, not us. This is not true of most countries. Usually it's the people who are told what rights they have. I know you've all learned this, like US history in June. But the people are assigned rights, and the government has everything else. Um, in the United States, and fracking is a great example, the people own the land on which people frack, and they make a million dollars, and the government has to tax them to make any revenue from it. In every other country in the world, fracking is a very difficult economic proposition because the government owns everything underneath the land. The resource underneath the land is government property. There's very few countries in the world that do it the way we did, where to the core of the planet, in some bizarrely, you know, <laughs> contracting triangle, I own, because I own this little plot in up in New Jersey, a frackable piece of land that, who knows, could make me a minute. It's more likely to get me whacked by somebody from the Sopranos. <laughs> so, the thinking that we have to, the, the kind of, approach we have to have to the United States when we look at the world is this is unusual. This is not a normal country. This is not a country motivated by the usual uh, the usual incentives. Um, add to that the fact that we are still really an enormously dominant power in the world, which has the luxury to talk in large rhetorical terms about the, the common good, but it's increasingly acting more like a common country and pursuing its own interests. Um, and it's a very complicated system. So that's my little preamble before I start criticizing what we do. 
Um, I want to do a moment on a bit of a counterintuitive argument. Um, there's a lot of talk about the BRICS. Um, a lot of that's beginning to wear thin. You're seeing uh, much of the, the kind of almost manic concern about the rise of the rest, as Fareed Zakaria calls it, um, begin to uh, tarnish. Um, I think that uh, just as that was overdone, the backlash against it will be overdone because we have this media that has this incredible ability to focus on this. Okay. Brazil is growing at 1.6%. Therefore, it will never attain great power status. Or Russia is tripping over itself and being wild. Now, Russia, I have a different take on it. Russia shouldn't have been growth in the first place. China's growth has moderated. India's growth has moderated. All of these things have happened for reasons that have nothing to do with the grand you know, kind of political argument in the United States over whether there are countries that are rising and falling and what we should do with them. These are geopolitical and geoeconomic issues that are causing the rise and fall of growth rates. And we shouldn't fetishize GDP growth. Um, it's an important thing to understand that GDP growth was developed, the double concept of growth, the, the, the statistic was developed during the Depression to try to understand what was happening to countries that were contracting suddenly. GDP, the, the, the concept of GDP does not measure the well-being, the power, the future potential of a country. It only measures outcome. And in a very kind of 1970s kind of way, it doesn't very well deal with black markets, for instance. Many countries have very large black markets that are should be significant parts of their GDP and are not. In our country, for instance, charity doesn't get measured well. Um, there are all sorts of transfers from government to, to uh, corporations that don't get factored properly. So GDP is a very raw measure. So to worry so much that you know the BRICS are growing at a certain rate or the United States is not growing at a certain rate, to worry too much about that is to get lost in the weeds. Um, what I would like to point out, though, is that the United States, as I said, um, has a good news story. The good news is not about our politics. It's not about whether immigration reform is being debated in a rational way. It's not about whether the outcome of the next midterm election will satisfy anybody in this room. It's not about whether Obama has been a good president or a disappointment or whether he was even born in the United States. Let's face it. The good news story in the United States is based on the fact that we are a disruptive, innovative country. And we continue to be the only country that can take a disruptive innovation and bring it to market. I know this is not the terminology you normally hear at BGIA. I hope you're getting more of it. Bring to market is a very key part of making something happen. You can have great ideas, but if you can't bring them to market, if you cannot take the idea of, hey, what if we did 156 characters? And then people could sign up, and we, if you can't take Twitter and then bring it to market, then Twitter is nothing. It never exists. It's just an idea someone had in a dorm room. Um, to me, the most important distinction between the United States and the rest of the world is not the fact that we have 11 aircraft carriers or that our, you know, uh, you know, our, you know, aircraft are probably the best in the world, or that even that our tech sector or our, you know, biotech sector is the best in the world. It's the fact that while we were on our backs in a recession, we developed world changing and introduced world changing uh, technologies and ideas onto the planet. Let me just name a few. The smartphone. The smartphone, maybe some of you had it in 2006, but most of you probably did. 2007, 2008 or so, the smartphone suddenly became you know, essentially ubiquitous in the United States. And then suddenly, very suddenly, around the world, even to the extent where a place like Libya 
had people who could upload video to a satellite from a revolution against one of the most virulent dictators on the planet. That's astounding. That's an astounding disruptive innovation. Twitter, Facebook, they're the vehicles. Really, actually, the smartphone should get the credit for, for those revolutions, not Twitter. Twitter is useful, but Twitter is just a vehicle by which people took this piece of hardware, amazing piece of hardware, and took photos and videos of something happening, and it changed the world. No longer did you have to wait for CNN to get in with a visa, right? So only 10 years earlier, it was only a brave news organization or a cajoling news organization that we get in. Um, hydraulic fracture, okay? You probably all hate it. Fracking is changing the planet in a variety of ways. I, I, I will give you that it may not all be good. But one of the things that is good about it is that there are energy supplying countries that have even less interest in climate change than really um, who will be severely damaged by fracturing, by, by hydraulic fracking. Um, that technology has changed the, balance, the energy balance of power in a very important way. It has put in the Western, uh, in the hands of the West, the ability to make important decisions about the future energy infrastructure of the world. Natural gas is an enormous step away from coal and from oil, if you want to look at it in climate change uh, terms. In economic terms, it's a, it's a game changer. It destroys the Russian, uh, essentially, if you look at Russia as a business, it destroys the Russian business model, which is based on gas that's priced high. Gas will not be priced high. Gas is very slowly coming down around the world. In the United States, it's so cheap that the Mexicans can't even afford to sell gas anymore. Um, but ultimately, this is a good thing. This gives the United States and other powers the ability to enforce reasonable regulations on the energy industry, which will if, if essentially block um, powers that would use energy to blackmail us. Um, that's a very important thing. That's been a, since the early 1970s, that's been a major burden of US foreign policy. Uh, it's been a very important check on the United States uh, from the powers that essentially regard us as a, an evil empire, for lack of a better term. Uh, it frees us from that problem. The other things that I would uh, name here, uh, 3D manufacturing, I don't know how much you know about that. It's an unbelievable step forward. Uh, it is a, a scientific you know, leap to, that you could create a jet turbine uh, rather than, it, it's, a, it's a painstaking uh, thing to create the, the little blades that go on a jet turbine. 3D manufacturing allows that to be done in an enormously uh, more efficient way and also in a more environmentally friendly way. Um, and I would add to that some innovation called REITs. Does anybody know what a REIT is? Just curious. Well, from a business group, and it's a real estate investment trust. So That's right. Know. Okay, so you know. <laughs> um, so, in spite of the fact that we knocked ourselves on our butt in 2008, economically, through all sorts of you know faith-based economics that really, I think, you know, and a lack of regulation, a dysfunctional regulatory system, we continue to innovate in that area, and that's important because some of our economy doesn't work. And it's important that we continue to try to fix it. REITs are real estate investment trusts, essentially give the average person the opportunity to do what they previously had to pay investment advisors to do. So if you have a 401k or a mutual fund, you're paying fees to some bank to move your money around. They're not usually, not even to move your money around. You're just paying fees for the for the privilege of deferring your tax burden until the day you start withdrawing. This is not a good system, because, well, you're not old enough, most of you. I've had one since somewhere in the mid-90s, and it went up until about 1999, and then stopped. And it's essentially useless. So I ported it over to a REIT, and I'm in charge of it. I may destroy myself, but uh, REITs are essentially the same vehicles without the fees. 
And that's changing the business model of investment banking. And you may have heard recently, or even this morning, that Barclays, for instance, just laid off 19,000 people. Uh, that's not good news, obviously, for those 19,000 people. But it is a part and parcel of the innovation that the United States continues to inject, disruptive innovation into the economy. If something's not working, we're going to destroy it. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's not. The final one I'll mention is weaponized drones. Okay? As I said, if something's not working, we're going to destroy it. Weaponized drones, astounding leap forward in weapons technology. Morality, I think, hasn't caught up with it. The moral conversation hasn't been had. I've, I've spoken to Air Force pilots who feel as though, and this is an interesting uh, moral argument, by not putting themselves at risk of death, it delegitimizes the process of dropping the bomb or shooting a missile at, at a target. It's a probably an argument that's just going to disappear into some hazy past and they'll say, oh, wasn't that cute? It's kind of chivalry, I guess. So, uh, but there are other arguments, too. And they are made often by the people who sit in San Diego and, and Omaha and other places and run these things like Xbox machines, uh, who have had suffered real dilemmas internally as to what they're doing on a daily basis versus the act of getting up afterwards, getting in their car, and, you know, going to work out in the gym. Uh, so I think there's a moral debate that's going to be gone, going on there. But again, the United States is the innovator in that sector. None of this means we're the best, or that God said we're going to be the best forever, or that we'll be the largest, and that China's growth will ebb and actually never overtake us. I think all that's nonsense, and it's all unimportant. If we continue to be the innovators and the ones who drive uh, technology, drive medical science, who drive military affairs to, to the extent to which we can be a stabilizing force in the world and not allow vacuums to open, that's good. And I see interesting and good um, examples of that and evidence that this is true. One final thing, and I think this is the slam dunk for the United States, and then I want to open it up to questions, because I could go on. Um, our, the enormous secret weapon of the United States is demographics. Of our rivals and allies and all the major economies of the world, um, we are the only advanced economy, certainly the only superpower, who's growing at a healthy rate in terms of our demography. Um, the uh, UNDP recently updated its numbers for the next 2050. And these are notoriously squirrely numbers. But they're, they're roughly, you have to base thinking on something. Um, UNDP growth numbers for the United States between now and 2050, with some caveats, are 28%. That's really good. That puts us in the same class as Mexico and Turkey and India. Now, India growing at 28% is actually a problem because India can't employ itself and it skewed its demographic with selective abortions. So there's going to be armies of young Indian men with no female cohort, which, as you know, if you've ever been to Hoboken on a Saturday, <laughs> is not a good thing. <laughs> this is a dangerous concept. Um, but it goes, it gets worse. I mean, these are the, these are the vaunted bricks that are going to overtake the United States. Um, Japan will, according to UNDP, will shrink by 50%, uh, which the worker to pensioner ratio is the key fact here. The number of people working versus the number of people, versus the number of people who have gone beyond the workforce are now depending on the state for support uh, will soar in Japan. In Russia, Russia's population will sink by 16%, Germany's by 13 China's will only grow by two, two percent. That's the one-child policy, uh, and that's going to be, and it's already hampering China's Chinese growth, because what's happening is, when you have, when you're growing at nine and ten percent in China, you've got an unlimited pool of people who will work under any condition for any price. 
as you see in the headlines now, Chinese workers are demanding rights. They're demanding environmental safety. They're demanding pay raises. Um, China's government is reacting with some uh, accommodation. They're also reacting by vilifying foreign countries and trying to push that off on only the foreign countries. You should raise your wages. You, you know, and, and essentially saying, oh, I, we, we detect corruption in your dealings with other Chinese country companies, as if there's no corruption between the state-owned companies. Um, that's a political game that can only go so far. The fact is, China is running up against a demographic problem, and it's being undercut by the Vietnamese, by the Bangladeshis, by the Thai, by the, uh, to some extent, in the higher end, the South Koreans and, and, uh, and Malaysian economies, who can now provide a uh, viable option for a big company that wants to offshore and put their production in Asia. Uh, China is not necessarily the destination for people who are deciding to put a you know, mid-level shoe factory or uh, a kind of a mid-level um, manufacturing concern into uh, Asia and then exporting abroad. The other problem they're having, of course, is, is true of all these countries. The price of gas, essentially the price of transport, has about tripled since the great explosion of offshoring in the United States in the early part of this century. So to get something back from China is very expensive. Um, so that has actually helped uh, lead to a very small return of manufacturing in the United States. Uh, combined, though, with the low gas prices that are happening because of frac fracking, there's a real uh, chance the United States will create manufacturing jobs in the next 15 to 20 years. That's unbelievable. And when I was a kid, Bethlehem Steel and U.S. Steel was still, you know, places we knew about because we went out skiing in the Poconos, and you go buy those places, and it, it was like gates of hell. But it, but it, those were middle class jobs in the United States. Those were those were guys who got out of high school, and their father said, "Don't waste your time in college. There's a union job there," and they go right into the mill. And it's hard work, but it was well paid and it was steady. And he worked for 20, 25 years, <coughs> retired on an, a defined pension, and they bought the place in the Jersey Shore. <laughs> and that's a Billy Joel's. <laughs> um, but it's true. That disappeared. I mean, in the course of five to seven years, it disappeared from the US landscape. That won't return because manufacturing today is a not a, as labor intensive as it was. 70s and certainly not in the era of World War II. But it will return in the sense that those companies uh, will choose to manufacture here for a variety of reasons. Um, let me talk one, one more good news story here and then I'll open to questions. The other thing I, I, I worry about is that our politics is filled with airbags, and you all know that. And they're on both sides of the aisle. The risk of American default, uh, that we wouldn't pay our bills, that the idea that we're going broke, that we're you know, uh, essentially a bankrupt nation is absurd, it's ridiculous. And in the space of the last, uh, let me make sure I get this right, the last three years, okay, the, the Congressional Budget Office, which is relatively nonpartisan, went from projecting a deficit in 2038 of 7% to a deficit in 2038 of 1.7%. That's That would be the best deficit we've had in decades. Our deficit last year, in fact, in fact was 1.7%. It's going to go up again. But the fact is, projections and statistics are very easy to manipulate. You have to make assumptions about growth. You have to make assumptions about tax rates about tax revenues, about the willingness of people to pay tax. All of these things are really malleable, but mostly it's growth. And if you make very you know, doom and gloom assumptions, uh, assumptions about growth, you're going to come up with really scary numbers. And depending on which district you're running in, um, that can be really good. Um, scaring people is one of the things that our politics does really well. Um, we're not as scary as we used to be overseas, apparently. 
Um, but we are very scary uh, in congressional districts, in, in individual congressional districts. If you look at what polls say today, Americans believe that China has already overtaken us, that not only are they a bigger economy, but they're richer people. It's astounding that there are so many billionaires in China that you wouldn't believe it. Uh, you know, it's the, the, this I blame not only on the scaremongering political class, but on the media, which is atomized uh, since I jumped in, um, and has really failed to educate. Um, there was a time when that was actually, you know, it's laughed out of the news right now, but it was actually this concept of public service that once existed in media. And um, they often say you don't miss something until you don't have it anymore. Um, but I think the country uh, is suffering very much from a, the lack of this fire, this fireside chat we used to have every night with one of three, unfortunately, one of three white guys, right? Uh, one of the three network anchors, and the vast majority of the country at some point tuned in and heard a strangely similar uh, recounting of the day from these kind of well coiffed, you know, tanned white guys. Um, and everybody at the time eventually got tired of that and decided this was corrupt. It must be, it must be awful. It must be, you know, synchronized. There must be some conspiracy. In fact, uh, what was at work there was there, there was a fairly decent system of demanding that uh, you take a, a, an objective uh, view of what should be on the news and you take an objective view of how to present the news. That all seems so boring today that no one would watch it. And you know, my former colleagues at NBC are struggling with that every day. Brian Williams, God bless him, uh, he is. He's broadcasting to an ever older audience. When I left NBC in 2005, the average age of the nightly news with Brian Williams was, I think, 67. Uh, and as you can see this from, you know, there's Celebrex commercials and cruises. And, you know, you can tell. Um, I think with, they're they're now onto diapers, and they, they they've gone from 67 to 71. Okay, so in the, in the course of a decade, they've gone to 71, right? Um, that is an audience that's literally dying. So that moment where this very, it's still 16 million people a night. It's a very powerful audience. It's still the largest in network news, and it dwarfs anything on cable news. But they're dying. What happens when that majority, if you add, let's say, another 10 from ABC and NBC and CBS, what happens when that group of people who actually are consumers, active consumers of news, they want a kind of a general sense of what's going on in the world every day, is replaced by, you know, people who just want to see Stephen Colbert? You know, I don't know. I think that's the great unknown right now. I'm a little worried about it. I, I, I'm concerned that people don't read enough. I'm concerned that the internet sites that people go to are predetermined that they give you what you want to hear because they're very clever marketing people in there, beginning from, from Al Jazeera to Fox, who say, if I tell them this, they're going to come back for more tomorrow. And that pressure didn't exist in newsrooms before. There were other biases that were all about kind of, it was really about, uh, I guess the word would be, being pedantic and a bit, and a bit overbearing and paternalistic. That was easier to see through, though, than the marketing nonsense that goes on today. So I'm very concerned that all of you as young people become intelligent consumers of news and you understand when you're being spun. Um, that was part of what I did, dedicated my class to when I taught here, was to just make people understand the difference between an opinion piece and an analysis piece and a news story. The very simple, simple concept that's completely lost today. Because now you go and you put in Ukraine, Putin, you don't know what you're doing really don't. Google's going to spit out the thing that's been read the most. That's the standard. Now. That's not enough. And particularly for smart people who care about the world and who are spending an awful lot of money on their education, uh, you should demand more. That's it. And I'll take some questions from everyone. Um, um, you talked about the uh, short-sightedness of American foreign policy, and I'd like to hear your comments in that context of 
about the United States, European Union, and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And I see, I, I'm a professor of international business, so I have a business background. And the U.S. does $40 billion a year in trade with Russia. And if someone said, that's what one person is worth, or Buffett. Right. Whereas Germany does $500 billion of trade and has deep uh, connections with Russia. And so my question is, why is the U.S. and uh, you know, the U.S. White House and the State Department and our head of intelligence so actively involved in Ukraine who really it's essentially up to Merkel? Well, okay, so... And so in the context of my question is that, could you give me a forecast 10 years from now how Ukraine will play out? <laughs> All right, slightly different at the end there. But, okay, so, mea culpa. I worked at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, when the wall came down. I know this part of the world. I know that the Balts, I, in fact, I used to sit next to the current president of Estonia, who was absolutely crazy, <laughs> um, but brilliant. Um, they do not trust the Europeans. They, they look at Europe as having you know, fed them to the wolves multiple times through history, the Poles in particular, the Czechs as well. Um, and they have naturally developed a constituency in the United States, particularly um, in the Eastern European uh, cities, populated immigrant cities of the Midwest in the United States. There's a lot of Poles, there's a lot of Germans, there's a lot of Czechs. There's, you know, if you go to Chicago, uh, you're going to run into this people. There is that now. There's an aging lobby in the United States, but um, the United States, as the you know kind of uh, mediator in, in the sense of of its self-created world order, um, is offended by what is a violation by Russia of a 1994 agreement not to mess with Ukrainian soldiers. I think we've been rather actually rather, you know, I guess the word would be cowardly about that. The Russians violated uh, an agreement they made in 1994 in exchange for Ukraine not pursuing nuclear weapons and delivering back those Soviet nuclear weapons based on its territory. The Russians agreed not to play with their borders. And so Putin, uh, not surprising to me, but Putin decided to violate that. We did nothing. Um, his reading of that is that I knew he would do nothing because he did nothing in Syria. And I, in fact, had to bail his ass out. And in fact, he did. It was Putin that saved Obama from looking like a fool by ginning up a phony chemical weapons uh, in arms. So I think President Obama has the right idea about the limits of American power, but the wrong idea about how to project it. I think he misunderstands the value of saying things you will never do. But he, he also says things, if you have to say things that you know will never happen and, and insist that you'll do them if they do. But you don't say things that you know might happen if you're not willing to do them. And that's the great mistake he made in Syria when he created this, you know, ultimatum about chemical weapons and Assad just crossed them. Because Assad kind of knew what he would do. Um, to get to your second party, so I think we've been a bit, um, I've been, we've been a pushover for the Russians. Um, Ukraine in 10 years, no one is going to look back and say, what a master stroke. Putin has Crimea. Yeah. Crimea is a dump without an economy and with a, a thuggish population uh, of people who are kind of, they feel separated from the motherland uh, in the way, in quite the way that people in Danzig and people in the Sudetenland and in other parts of the former Austro-Hungarian Empire that spoke German felt separated from their motherlands in the 30s. He's taking advantage of a very specious, uh, you know, oddity, which is that the empire he loved collapsed. It 
when it collapsed, it had colonized, essentially, areas of other parts of the, of the world. And those little islands of Russians feel left out. The um, best way to deal with that would be to negotiate with the governments involved for Russian language schools or for special minority status or whatever. Instead, he's now using it as a way to claim back territory. I mean, he's made no secret of the fact that he thinks the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. I mean, anybody who says that is clearly not living on the same planet that I am. Um, I think in 10 years, Ukraine will be um, Finland, a gigantic poor. When I say Finland, not the Finland you know and love now that creates Nokia phones. And, uh, it's the Finland of the Cold War, which is unable to move in either direction um, for fear of uh, alienating one or another of its protectors or threats. Um, and I don't believe it, Ukraine has the native capability to break out of that. They, their, their politics is more dysfunctional than any place in Europe, save perhaps Russia itself. And they don't have the natural resources to, to grow their way out of it. So I think there's, you know, unless Putin is history quickly from something that happens within Russia, I think Ukraine is in a very difficult place and it's not going to be rescued by NATO. I find it ironic you did not talk about the European Union or Germany in your answer. You talked about Russia and the U.S. I'll take that up. If Germany's, <laughs> Germany, is not a, Germany is not a normal country. Germany is a country that um, has, I, if you look at Germany and Japan, there's very two interesting, interesting historical developments there. Japan has decided to deny its past and yet shelter under the uh, American security umbrella to save money, effectively, and to not piss off its customers and, and clients in Asia. Germany has been effusively apologetic about its past, and yet has chosen to, to uh, also shelter in the American security umbrella, mostly because it's good business. Um, the Germans make a lot of money in their trade with Russia. The Europeans in general, the Italians, the Spanish, the Czechs, make a lot of money in Russia. Increasingly, that comes with an enormous cost. Society Generale, for instance, the big French bank owns, I think, 67% or something of uh, Rosneft, the big Russian oil firm. That's a disastrous risk for that company. Um, they, may, they may have made a lot of money over the years, but it could be suddenly uh, halted tomorrow by a simple skirmish on the, on the Baltic border between a Russian and NATO aircraft. Um, so Russian the, the risks of doing business in Russia risen enormously. Germany's not going to back out right away. But um, remember, we encouraged the Germans to be the bridge to the Russian economy in the early part of the 1990s when we were kind of prescribing this kind of shock therapy for the Russian economy. Uh, the fact is the Russian economy never accepted it. It was, it was a situation where the assets of the former Soviet state were doled out to people who were connected in high places to the Soviet Union, and then went out and did business with not just the Germans, but with Exxon, and with Target, and with Ford. The biggest shock I had last year when I was in Moscow was that every, every kind of young Russian kid is driving a Chevy pickup. It seems to be the big rage in, in Moscow these days. So, um, you know, it's not just the Germans. Another, I, so we were talking about statistics, a uh, statistic I heard last night at an event I was doing for my internship, um, which is with a global education organization, um, was that the racial composition of our country is going to radically even out in the coming decades, and we're going to have substantially less minor minorities, and I was wondering what you were thinking, what you thought about, some of the things you didn't mention was was the kind of race conversation in relation to our economic growth? I think, um, you know, my sense of this is that uh, if you look across decades, um, race in the United States is, you can, you can look at it statistically and say, okay, 
African Americans are not closing the gap um, on, you know, Caucasian or white, whatever you want to call it, Americans economically, income, you know, variety, educational achievement, etc. The fact is, those statistics fail to take into effect into account the fact that those distinctions are ridiculous now. Who's, what is Derek Jeter? What is Tiger Woods? Is that a white guy? Hispanic guy? Black guy? I, I don't know. In 1970, we would have come up with some ridiculous term for it. Um, the fact is, um, American society is moving very quickly toward a consensus that's going to leave red states um, out in the cold. Uh, and there's a reason now that um, there, there's always going to be an underclass, and it's going to be white, black, Hispanic, and, and every other color. Um, but there's a reason that um, the engines of economic growth in the United States are not based in you know, red state, Midwest. If you look at the government uh, transfers, the, the statistics on government transfers, tax transfers, it's almost always to the states of the South and to the, the lower, upper Midwest, where um, it's a very homogenous and Depopulating kind of a, uh, of a situation. Um, I think that what, what's happening in the race in the United States is largely incrementally good. Um, in generational terms, it's fantastic. I mean, there's no there's no comparison uh, between what re race relations were like in 1969, or let's say let's try to make it even 1974. Uh, and 1904, uh, 19, and 2014. I mean, it's just a different world. I, I grew up in the outskirts of North New Jersey. You simply did not go as a white person into North New Jersey in 1974 because the racial tension was so enormously. There were there was political violence. It was never branded that way, but that's essentially what it was. It was racial political violence. That doesn't exist. Now. There's violence in Newark like in all big cities, but it's based mostly on drug and gang uh, you know, motivations. Uh, I think what you're also seeing is, uh, in many of the statistics on income inequality, um, you're seeing a very, once again, very broad and, and kind of lumpen statistics that don't properly capture the difference between a life lived in 1970 and a life lived in 2010. Um, some of this has been pointed out by conservative critics of, of the current conversation. That people have Michael Jordan sneakers, and they have flat screen TVs, and they've got, et cetera. Yes, that's true. There's blame, right? But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the literal threat of, uh, you know, of deep disenfranchisement where you can't vote don't have access to any, some, you get in some cases in the old days, any real schooling um, past the grammar school years because you had to send your kids to work, um, where you couldn't walk into a public hospital and demand service. Now, that's a dysfunctional way to provide service, but that situation really doesn't happen these days without recourse. I mean, it certainly will happen, but there is recourse. You, that's illegal for a hospital to turn somebody away who's ill. It's illegal. They may transport you to the public hospital, uh, which isn't great. It's all dysfunctional. But this is a light year away from 1970. So what I get concerned about is when I see statistics that uh, just broadly take uh, a swath of the population and generalize. Because if you, again, I, I, I like to contextualize and look at history. It's just not the case that uh, the average Af African American child has a no better chance of success than they did in 1970. I don't believe that. I believe that they're still disadvantaged. I think I, I'm not. I don't like the Supreme Court's decision in, on, on affirmative action. I think that was kind of bad. It was an ideological decision, not based on, on numbers. On the other hand, the idea that you know. You can't ignore the fact that Barack Obama is president of the United States. I mean, this is simply something that, you know, my grandparents would have swore up and down it wouldn't have happened for 300 years, um, and yet it did. So, again, you know, we we tend to be our own worst enemies. We panic at things, we, uh, but we are also incredibly corrective country. We we 
managed to correct some mistakes you know, in a fairly, fairly rational way, often creating new ones, um, with new problems. But we tend to be introspective at important junctures in our history, and I think that's happening right now. And Obama, in many ways, hit, hit the phenomenon of, a, of Barack Obama, whatever you might think of it, after eight years of presidency, uh, is a corrective. He was a corrective against a, a, a unilateralist, somewhat, uh, you know, kind of populist president who made all sorts of decisions that ultimately cost us a great deal of money, blood, and treasure. Yes. Yes. Grant, thank you for taking the time to speak with us tonight, and thank you to Bart for putting this event on. Um, turning back to foreign policy for a moment, I, I share your assessment of the kind of folly of you know, making a speech about a red line that you're not willing to follow through on. But turning back to Ukraine and Russia, uh, you know, given the American public's lack of, in, of interest in foreign engagements right now, given the reluctance of European allies to get on board with any sort of, of sanctions, given the lack of a clear U.S. strategic interest in what happens in Eastern Ukraine, um, I'm wondering how you sort of square those those facts with your desire for a stronger top of policy you, in Moscow. You, as a president, you have to decide whether you're going to run your administration to win elections or whether you're going to make decisions based on the best interest of the country and the world. Obama has chosen elections. But and so did Clinton, by the way. Sure. Um, but I mean, how does that square with the fact that no matter how tough Obama wants to be, the Europeans aren't on board? It doesn't sure. matter. We're, if, we, if we decided to uh, take Spare Bank, uh, VTB, and tell our banks you could no longer use them as counterparties in your financial transactions, it, the, the flight of capital from Cyprus and Russia into Western banks would be incredible. It would it would undermine the entire Russian economy. It's it's already happening slow. Russians are not stupid. Russians with money, fifty one billion dollars of money left the, the Russian economy in the first quarter of this year. Um, what happens in the second quarter? I don't have the figures yet, but it's likely to be at least as bad. Um, most of that, because of the centralization of power and, and wealth in Russia are people who have a very direct both stake in, in the survival of Putin, but also a very, very careful, uh, carefully tuned antenna to what's going on in the Kremlin. Uh, and the fact that they're moving money out, the fact that the Russian government can't stop it, uh, it's interesting. And this is just with little pats on the hand from the West so far. I mean, if the, if the US and the UK we're the only ones that matter in the financial system. If the UK banks and the US banks decided to get tough, the Russian economy, it, there's no, there's a retaliatory effect. It would hurt certain parts of the American economy, it would hurt the European economy a little more, but the Russian economy could not sustain that for long. The compact that Putin has made with the Russian middle class is very clear. Stick with me. I'll let you blog occasionally. Um, I will keep growth going along. And if you're close to us, you will even profit. You won't be harassed by my text police. Uh, but if you turn into Alexei Navalny, um, you'll be in trouble. Or if you start telling the truth about the economy, you'll have to go into exile. So that's not a that's not a long-term business plan. <laughs> That's a problem, and, and I think Putin, uh, I think actually the Ukraine move was more akin to what the, the Argentines did when they took the Falklands in 1982. There's not been a lot of talk about the analogy there, but I think Putin's, the, the model that he set up for Russia, which is a kind of klepto energy state, is running out, in part because the US is undermining it with fracking in part because Russia has no real friends in the world. They've, they've got people who have to be their friends. Beyond that, there really aren't, even the, even those who really kind of agree that the Americans are kind of arrogant, we'd like to see them taken down a notch, are not particularly willing to, to live in a world that's instead dominated by Vladimir Putin. So it's not exactly a great brand, right? Uh, they, I have a friend who's a, a, a British footballer fanatic. There's a team in London, some of you may have heard of, called No Wall. No Wall's like the, the bane of British football. They're, they're brutal. They 
you know, kind of awful fans who beat each other during games. You know, it's awful. And they, they have this chant, you don't like us, we don't care. He's a Russian affairs Spanish specialist. He says, Russia is Millwall. You don't like us, we don't care. And that, that's their chant. And I think that's true. As long as things are turning over for the elites, as long as they are able to project a uh, sense of great power, um, in, in spite of the fact that I think it's a country in decline, both in power and economics, and, and certainly in, in moral standing, um, I think you know, as long as they can project something different, I think they feel good about it. But that's a short term. Yes. Um, so you talk a lot about disruptive innovation, and I think the foundation of that is a lot of people doing technology and working in that field. So are you concerned with um, the prospects of like STEM majors in a higher education within the United States, like science, technology, engineering, yes. math? Yes, yes. And uh, I, mean, I mean, half of the problem is our backwards immigration uh, approach to immigration, which I don't think will survive the next five years. I think okay. uh, in, a, in a time like this when, when prospective uh, candidates for the Republican nomination are starting to talk about immigration reform, then you know the consensus that the, the, the middle can't hold, the middle being a reasonable gridlock over immigration. Having said that, most of the debate right now is on letting in uh, the members, family members of, of ten people who tend to work in the lower runs of, of the economy. The, um, the visas that uh, are important to Google and Microsoft and Cisco, et cetera, um, are a more sensitive issue, but they're not an issue that tends to get into camp political campaigns. I think once the big issue of immigration, that we come to some kind of a route to citizenship type of solution, I think that's going to happen. Um, the technicalities of letting in people with special skills will, will fall into place. Uh, the other thing that's happening in the world is that, you know, we are watching this happen in Canada, in Germany, in some South American countries where um, these type of visas are being handed out for good reason because these people bring needed skills to an economy. And you just look at the, I think, I can't know, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but there are a significant number of the Nobel Prize winners uh, from the United States since 2000 were actually born in the Soviet Union, um, and probably a few in China as well. There were also, um, you know, Sergey Brin, one of the co-founders of, of Google, was born in the Soviet Union. And it's not, um, it's not, I hate to say it, it's not rocket science. These, these are people we should welcome with open arms, as we welcomed ballet dancers during the Cold War. Now, having said that, the other side of it is a question about education policy. Um, I'm the proud father of a scientist who's graduating this week from, from Irwin College with a geology degree and wants to be a paleontologist, okay? She may not change the world, but I'm so proud that she's a woman in science. Um, and she stuck to that, you know, no matter how hard she, she kind of felt as though, you know, she was often the only woman in some classes she took. And, um, I really love the fact that she stuck with it. Um, so had, taking that gender aspect out of it, I think American students, as I think the most recent statistics that were just released this week show, are stagnating in a fantastic way. Um, American students have um, been saddled with a kind of um, statist uh, educational system where the incentives have of late really favored the administration of education rather than, and the business of education rather than the, you know, actual, you know, imparting of education. And that is something that gets away from the classic kind of, um, you know, model that we, had, we grew up with, I think, in the 30s and the 40s. But having said that, the United States was the first country to adopt universal public education. This, I think, is a growing pain, it's a, and it's a multi-generational growing pain. And it's a result of the fact that we don't send kids at age 16 into technical routes. I, myself, am split about that. I lived in Germany and saw 
that if you got to age 16 and you had not excelled in the more academic side of your studies, you could do a Fachschule as opposed to a Hochschule. Hochschule is high school, Fachschule is a kind of technical school. I would have ended up in a, in a, in a, Hochschule, in a Fachschule because I was a bad kid <laughs> until I was about age 8th in ninth grade. And then I kind of realized, oh my god, I don't want to work at a gas station. Um, but I think um, I have I'm I have mixed feelings about that. I think there should be more technical education in the United States that leads to a route for kids that is both practical in terms of the skills that the job market are demanding, and then at the end of that road gives them the opportunity if they've excelled in that technical side to look at places like Caltech and, and Rensselaer all these places where they could move on into higher scientific education. I think our country tends to lose that whole, uh, that whole side of our brain to uh, plumbing and electrical and, you know, they're trades. And once you've decided to go into the trades in the United States, you're kind of there. You're not aspiring and you're not, you don't have a role models to go into uh, the next step, which would be, you know, a, not a technical university necessarily, but something, you know, pure science. Um, so I'd like to see that, engineering, you know. Um, now, so I hope I answered some of that. The other thing I would say is the quality of engineers that come out of, the enormous numbers of engineers that come out of India and China and, and many other countries is abysmal. Uh, many of them are very, they're incapable of functioning in a real um, high level engineering uh, company. And, I've learned that through my, I had some association with General Electric um, in Brazil and in South Africa. And, uh, you know, both of these countries turn out a lot of engineers in their universities. They cannot, they, they, they are years away from taking an entry level engineering job in, in, in a major big, in Siemens or, or GE or Alstom or any of these big international uh, engineering firms where if you come out of the University of Texas with an engineering degree, you're pretty much there. It's standard. You'll know it. So um, while there are numbers that, that suggest we are um, stagnating, um, we're also a country that has a bizarre elite level um, that, over, that overachieves. And you can look at that two ways. You can look at that as a, as a factor of income inequality and quality generally in the United States. I don't really. I think in some ways that's a problem that needs, there's, there's a plumbing problem in our educational system. Um, and it needs, it need, there needs to be um, a ladders that move you from community college, if you're, if you're smart and you just don't have the money to do it, uh, that move you from community college into a, a decent four-year college that will allow you to really look at the larger world of opportunity. Because if you don't, you'll only see something much more narrow. And I think that is a challenge. Um, so I hope I answered some. Thank you. Yes. Oh, last one. Is there about uh, the shift in India and how like, the United States is seeing it? Is that a new of course, as a talks about how civility has gone out the window. Um, I think civility is a lost cause, especially in New York and New Jersey. <laughs> but um, my, my sense of it is this. Um, the means of production, so to speak, um, chained, were destroyed by the internet. And I actually was uh, you know, in the vanguard of that. Um, it sounded like a Marxist moment. Um, I worked at MSNBC.com in 2006 when it was launched. And I was very excited about the prospect because I had just come from the BBC, which was a very old statist institution that had very carefully figured out rules about what you'd cover and how you'd cover them. And um, I didn't get tired of that so much as I got excited by the prospect of being able to 
do more than the BBC, not less than the BBC. Unfortunately, what the internet has turned out to be is less. Um, and you know, what we were able to do in the old days, and this is something that I don't think many people in your generation ever encounter, is to throw onto the wall, which might have been the front page of a newspaper, or it might have been a half hour television uh, news show, um, a menu of things that were not digital, they were analog. So you had to kind of look at them and decide what you were going to read. And you couldn't make it disappear forever by clicking. And then the rest of the front page would just disappear, right? So you, there's a lot of less serendipity in what you, in what you stumble across in the world. And, and I don't want to sound you know, you know, you know, condescending, but I think at your age, you shouldn't be channeling yourself in such a way that the rest of the world is gone. That, oh, I already know what I like, right? You might not. You know, you don't make, you might, there might be viewpoints that you haven't encountered yet, or there might be countries or, or industries or scientific discoveries that you won't naturally, that won't find you the way that I always used to ask, how do you, how do you find news when you, my classes, you know, what do you do when news happens? Oh, it finds me. That's a very blasé idea. Because if you if you like, you know, NASCAR and Hollywood and, and the New York Yankees and okay, a little bit of stock market news, you may never hear about how the bar being common, right? That may not the average person think like oh, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. But these things do matter because the succession of the of that dark space where my husband Mubarak has been toppled, to me, adds up to the, the bewilderment of the United States when 9 11 happened. Um, absolute bewilderment. As if, why don't they love us? You know, idiot, because you've been bombing Iraq every day for uh, 10 years. Uh, you don't know that because you don't read the news. <laughs> uh, but in effect, I think the, the greater the vacuum and the self created vacuum that Personalization and uh, you know the Googleization, the algorithmic uh, effect that, that Google has had on news. The, the the harder it is to have a real conversation with anybody because they think they know everything because they read every day the same thing every day. And so to to introduce something new or something dissonant to what they think about either immigration, or the economy, or banking or whatever is you're clearly a heretic, or, or not, not because I read Fox News every day. Uh, that's just not true. Um, so that's what I, I think we've lost. We've lost this kind of place where you accidentally stumble across things you didn't, you wouldn't normally read, or a place where, in the case of the, the old network news um, model, they were forced to try to create an objective-ish report for the largest possible audience because the economic reason for doing it, of course, was always to have the largest possible audience. But in order to do that, you tried to alienate the least possible audience. Um, that was all destroyed when, when cable created separate channels of information. Now we get we get the flavor we want. Uh, and that's why CNN is gone. You know, CNN is still a place where people go when the big story happens because they have that brand. But on a day-to-day -day basis, they're still kind of plugging away at the old model of we're going to tell you what we know, right? Not what we think. We're not going to put a lot of. They're getting more sexual. But, <laughs> Pretty yeah. quickly here. But yeah, but yeah. they haven't gone full over to the kind of talking head, uh, spinster model. But they, uh, economics are pushing them in that direction. They almost have to. Thank you so much for having us.